Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brett Stahlbaum. I'm a teaching professor of visual arts here at UC San Diego in the Department of Visual Arts, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Qualcomm Institute's Ideas Initiative for Digital Exploration of Arts and Sciences. Ideas provides a public interface, workspaces, and the cutting edge technology being developed at Qualcomm Institute, all in support of research into interdisciplinary and experimental performances. Today's performance is Sun Eaters by Grace Grothaus. But before I introduce Grace, there are some thank yous and some shout outs to make. There are many people here to acknowledge for their leadership, starting with Qualcomm Institute's director Ramesh Rao, who oversees this tremendous and diverse research enterprise. I also want to acknowledge the retired but never actually really retired founder of CalIT2, Larry Smarr, and other pioneers of computing such as Thomas DeFanti and Sheldon Brown and Lev Manovich, uh, who are important parts of the history of Qualcomm Institute. And indeed, there is a rich history here. Not only has Qualcomm Institute provided visionary leadership in new technology, in which art making is considered an equal partner, but also in wearing my hat primarily as an educator of undergraduates, I really sincerely thank everybody at Qualcomm Institute for how they have enriched undergraduate education at UCSD over the years. In fact, um, one of the shout outs, my VizArts 10 class is in attendance here tonight. And I wanted to also say hi to all of the interdisciplinary computing in the arts majors and speculative design majors and, and other students in that course. Also, super thanks to Shiro Kyadagari, who is the newly appointed Associate Director of Qualcomm Institute. Congratulations and the director of ideas, as well as a faculty member in our music department. This is the second ideas performance of the season. The first was John Burnett's Hydra just a few weeks ago. And on an important note, the third will be Thursday, June 3rd at 5 p.m. This is a theatrical work titled Pia's Adventures in Tlaxandia. And, and it's an augmented theater and dance work led by UCSD's professor Robert Castro of our Department of Theater and Dance and many collaborators. Please see ideas.calit2.net for more information and to register for that event. I also want to acknowledge, you know, the really incredible team at Qualcomm Institute who has done an amazing job in helping to keep the research wheels turning during the global pandemic. Uh, Hector Bracho, uh, Megan Easton, Maximo Carrion, uh, Ruben Huerta, uh, Soshi Rojas Roja, Scott Blair, and of course, my dear colleague, Trish Stone, you are all amazing people. You rose to the challenge of some incredibly difficult and sad times, and UCSD really wouldn't be what it is without, without you. So moving on to tonight's performance, Grace Grothaus is an, act, is an artist whose research questions center around the present global climate crisis and futurity. Her research and making is focused on environmental sensing and visualization, and her projects take the form of indoor and outdoor installations, often interactive and responsive in nature. She's deeply concerned with the question of how to foster empathetic relationships between human beings and our more than human environs in order to address current critical issues. Her artwork has been exhibited across the United States and abroad on five continents, including the Second World Creativity Biennale in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in Durban, South Africa for the International Symposium of Electronic Art and Environmental Crisis, an art and science exhibition in London, UK. Uh, Grothaus has received awards for her work from organizations such as the National Foundation for the Advancement of the Arts, uh, and she was an Art 365 Fellow. She's been invited to speak about her work for the University of California, San Diego's Design at Large series and Echo Art Space, among others. Currently, Grothaus is concluding an MFA in visual art at, in our Department of Visual Arts here at UC San Diego. And in the fall, we'll begin working towards a PhD in digital media from York University in Toronto. Recent trends in situated art and technology practice have been leading artists into the outdoors and even remote landscapes. This trajectory is not new. Uh, there's a long history of artists engaging in technology in the landscape. Ancient rock art through landscape painting and photography to land art, site-specific practices, walking works, and recently explorations of emerging technologies in the hands of artists such as Grothaus. Among the emerging technologies are sensors, controllers, 
radio-based sensor networks, and edge computing. Technologies that can sense the world around them are also not new. Think of the thermometer. But digital communications technologies have led to a qualitative and quantitative transformation through automation, data collection, number crunching, and in fact, it has sent these sensor platforms, which also include our mobile phones, that have become a major constituent of a problem called the big data problem. And this is all well known. But what, what is less known is what artists have been doing with sensing and data in outdoors environments and in our various landscapes in cooperation with Earth's biome. There are definitely underexplored issues in the art world, such as sensor aesthetics, the formal pr properties of mesh networks, and yet to be discovered experimental practices and conceptual frames for new kinds of artist-made feral technologies in the wild. I am so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce you to one of a younger generation of artists who are working in this terrain. So as we now say in uh, our online meeting uh, terms, Grace, the screen is yours. Hi, my name is Grace Grothaus, and I want to talk with you a little bit about Sun Eaters, my installation that's installed right now at Cal IT2 on the UC San Diego campus. Sun Eaters here is measuring the bioelectricity that's present in these trees, that's present in us, and present in all living things, and it's translating it to visible light so that we can see it. I've placed these installations along this uh, frequently traveled sidewalk so that people who are walking through their daily lives can stop for a moment and focus on the often overlooked vegetation that's all around us. Uh, plant blindness is a tendency to overlook the non-human things, the trees, the grasses that are growing all around us in favor of the human action that's taking place, almost as though this was a backdrop, where in fact they're as equally important as we are. And my hope is that this installation of Sun Eaters will show us that. The name Sun Eaters refers to the fact that the plants themselves are consuming the sunlight and the water and translating that into through their chlorophyll into food for themselves. We have a tendency to overlook the plants that are all around us, and yet they're extremely important to our future. Uh, Trees are one of our very best carbon sequesters, and atmospheric carbon is what's causing the climate change crisis that we're experiencing today. So my hope is that this installation can call attention to the more than human world around us and be part of a change, a change in the way that we perceive our world around us, that we perceive all species as being important, vital parts of our world that work together as an interconnected ecosystem uh, so that we can have a future that doesn't involve temperature rise and sea level rise and polluted air. The way the Sun Eaters installation is working is these two solar panels here are taking in energy from the sun throughout the day and they're loading a battery and that battery is used to continuously power of a small computer, it's called a microcontroller, that I've programmed to take in the data that's being received from the electrocardiogram sensor, ECG sensor, and then translate that to an output that's measurable as light in the form of an LED. 
and everything is installed to be completely waterproof. Uh, this is actually the second installation of this uh, series of lights. And the first was at the Lux Art Institute in Encinitas, California, where it was installed from October 2020 until just this past month, during which time it was exposed completely to the elements, many storms, with no issue at all. And so it's pretty exciting that we've reached a point where the electronics components that are available that we can use to make artworks such as this are durable enough when using waterproof housing to make something like this possible. So it's a really exciting moment that we're at right now in year 2021 in terms of environmental sensing that we're able to make artworks like this where we can see things and show them to you that are out in the environment that we wouldn't previously be able to do. 10 years ago, you'd think about computers as being pretty fragile. They're not very water resistant. Um, they can't be outside in the elements for a really long time. Uh, but at this particular moment, there's almost uh, an upswelling of environmental sensing uh, work being done that is possible from these new technologies that are emerging. So it's a really exci exciting space for me to be researching in and developing projects. Um, on the sciences side of things, we've been looking at uh, remote environmental sensing for some time now. Um, and in just recently, in the past several years, this has started to emerge in a big way in um, the computational arts, in the arts that deal with computation. Um, computational arts is really the space that I find myself in as an environmentalist that's thinking about climate change because we wouldn't know about climate change if it weren't for computational measurements. We don't have a sense of how much carbon is in our atmosphere if we don't model that using computational capacities. The history of computing and the history of environmental awareness is actually deeply intertwined. If you look at the 1970s, that is a decade in which computational capacity was just ever increasing year by year. And so was our capacity to understand what was happening in our atmosphere. We have researchers that were taking measurements and taking these and putting them into modeling softwares and predicting what they thought would take place in terms of climate change, particularly atmospheric warming um, in the coming decade, the coming 50 years. And what's really interesting to take a look at is that almost all of these predictions of where we would be at in terms of increased warming have been extremely accurate. Uh, not every study, but a majority of the studies that were done at that time uh, render what's now happening in year 2020, now 2021, with great accuracy. I'd like to talk now a little bit more about how Sun Eaters is measuring the bioelectricity in the trees that it's placed on. Um, here you'll see two electrodes. These pads are just stuck onto the trunk. They're not uh, entering the tree in any way. And what they're doing is just harmlessly measuring the electrical flux inside the tree as it changes. And then that signal is being sent down through the wire into the junction box, the waterproof junction box, where I can translate that signal to the light. Uh, what's going on inside the tree is that as digestion takes place um, in living processes within all living things, um, this ion flux happens within the cells and as the ions are fluxing, the, you can measure that in terms of an electrical charge. And so across the space between the two electrodes, there is a, a measurement that can be taken in terms of um, time, point A and point B. And that is what is generating the data source from which this light is shifting. It's interesting to think about the similarities, but also the differences between humans and plants. You know, if we were to place these electrodes on us, we would be measuring our own heartbeat. And a human heartbeat is basically approximately 60 to 90 beats a minute on average. 
Uh, however, for a tree, they don't have cell differentiation in organs in the same manner. But that doesn't mean that they don't have shifts in life processes. They actually function on a diurnal cycle, which means that approximately twice a day, you can think about it in terms of a 12-hour cycle. So the tree is most active at dawn and also at dusk. And right now as dusk, you can see how active the light is in shifting with the energy that's fluxing inside the tree. I recently spent six months pretty remotely in the Mata Atlantica forest in South America. And I became really acquainted with the rhythms of the forest there. And I can tell you it's interesting that it seems like just about every species there has that kind of diurnal cycle on a 12 hour cycle. They are, there's the bird calls at dawn. There are monkey choruses at dawn. And the same thing at dusk. Um, it just seems that the, even the trees in the forest, we can't hear them, but through this light, we can see that they also are participating in this dawn and dusk diurnal cycle. There's a, a rhythm to the day, a rhythm to all living things, um, a rhythm to our own living beings as well. We just tend to be really distanced from that inside cities and with electric lights. Um, but this is a way of being able to connect with that a little and to see it, to be able to see the plant as being part of our world. Uh, humans are always using things like lights to capture attention, right? Um, you can think of stoplights when you're driving around or even a stop sign that has been outfitted with LED lights because it's an often run stop sign and so they add LED lights to it so that people will actually stop and pay attention. And so I think of this installation of Sun Eaters in that same way where I'm trying to arrest your attention and get you to pay attention to the incredible life that's all around us. A recent development that's been happening in my art practice is I'm, I'm starting to think about the things that I'm making, my artworks, as tools. Uh, tools for helping us to see kind of educational aids in a way. Um, deeply motivated by trying to communicate climate change, climate futures, through an understanding of the world as it is now and how it's changing really rapidly. And to me, it seems like one of the best ways that I can do that is by developing tools that help you to see it more actively and in a different way. Uh, so that's kind of the motivation behind starting to play with these ECG sensors and visualize the bioelectricity of these trees and translate that to light for you to see, help you to notice the plants that are around us, the important role that they play in the world and sequestering carbon and helping combat the effects of climate change. Uh, some other projects that I'm starting to develop involve also creation of these tools, uh, these aids for being able to see things. I'm starting to think about uh, the invisible toxins that are in our air all around us that are affecting our health. I started researching this in um, 2019 uh, and seeing that the very small particles of carbon in our air, they're not just creating a warmer climate for us, they're also affecting our health right now. They affect our lungs, our cardiovascular system. They affect children in their development. Um, perhaps one way that I can reach people in making uh, changes in their life that will lessen the impact of climate change is talking with them about the health impacts that it's having right now. Not in the distant future, not in the near-term future, but today, um, the health impacts that the carbon in our air are having. So I'm, I'm using sensing uh, tools to try and help measure that black carbon in terms of particularly uh, molecule size PM 2.5. Uh, and show that to uh, people so that they can see what they're breathing in. This became 
uh, more serious once the pandemic broke out. Uh, we started thinking about, in a way, what we couldn't see because it was affecting us. The pandemic has really impacted the way that we see our world. We think a lot about the invisible microbes that are in the air that we breathe in. Um, but we talk less perhaps about the carbon that's also in our air that's affecting our health. I hope that I can continue making environmental sensing tools that help us to see our world for what it is and, and hopefully what it can be. This is better than where we're headed if we don't make changes. Some of the inspiration for Sun Eaters was playing around with an ECG sensor and house plants that I had by my studio, um, but also looking at work from the 1970s in which musicians were recently working with MIDI and they would take these measurements of plants and trees, electricity, and they would translate it to music. They were touching the plants and interacting with them and seeing how that changed the sounds that they could record and thinking about what that might mean in terms of uh, communication between the plants and the people. I didn't want to go the same route and work with music, but I think there's a, a directness, a simplicity in translating it to light that is really great because uh, electrical impulses, uh, electricity, it comes in waves. It's on the same electromagnetic spectrum as light. It's just at a different frequency. So for me, it felt a little bit more honest to translate it to light. It's like a spectrum shift um, than to try to think of it in terms of a composition the way a musician would. I'm less interested in composing. Composing is almost a, a, a means of controlling the outcome. Um, and I, I want the plants to perform, I want the trees to perform. Um, I set up these conditions, the parameters by which we can see this light, but what's actually happening in terms of the light flux is completely up to the plant and its biological processes at any given moment. It's not controlled by me in any way. I'm just measuring it and translating it for you to see. There are a lot of artists working in the space of environmental sensing that are very inspiring to me, and among them are artists like Natalie Jeremanjenko and Beatrice de Costa, who did a lot of work in the space of air quality sensing. She would put her electronic sensors on the um, packs that were attached to carrier pigeons, and they would fly through the air and collect real-time data uh, in cities, um, up in LA in particular, where they're dealing with smog and air pollution issues in a pretty serious way. Um, what is inspiring to me is how I keep coming across artists that are working in environmental sensing. Um, I first installed Sun Eaters in October of 2020, um, and then a couple months later I came across an artist who lives in Canada um, who is doing really exciting work also with measuring different aspects of trees named Jane Tingley. Um, and in fact, I'm actually headed up to Toronto in the fall to start a PhD in digital media where I'll get a chance to work with her a little bit and I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but I've worked with incredible artists during my master's here at UC San Diego where we are right now with Sun Eaters installed. Um, artists like Brett Stahlbaum, a computational artist that does work as well with environmental sensing out in the desert. Um, and Pinar Yoldash, and she's working in environmental futures, speculative spaces as well. Um, there's so much exciting work that's taking place right now in this area. Um, it'll be a, interesting to watch in the next few years and see where this type of work leads. The light here is measuring the bioelectricity of this tree um, and it's, it's fully bright, which means that this tree is right now um, measuring at a, at a level that's at the peak capacity of this light to really output that. Um, but I'd like to show you what happens when um, these electrodes are placed on me because they are ECG sensors, they're electrocardiograph 
sensors. And we use those, you might see them at like a doctor's office or in some smart electronics that measure uh, your heart rate for fitness purposes. So you, same type of sensor. And so you can see that these electrodes will measure my heartbeat and output that. And so you can see that a human heart rate, while it might be much faster than the electrical pulse of a tree or on a much different temporal scale, that there's a lot in common between us. Something I'm really interested in with the way that I've chosen to display the Sun Eaters installations is um, thinking about interspecies communication. You know, the tree can't speak with us in a way that we can understand it, but what if it had a prosthetic device that was able to act as an aid so that you could see a little bit of what was going on and hear the tree in a way um, so I think of these a bit like that, almost um, not just visualization devices, but um, curious about the visual analogy even of um, surveillance. What if the tree could surveil us in the same way that we are always surveilling the world around us? Thank you so much for joining me tonight to talk about Sun Eaters. And if you'd like to, I'd love to talk with you a little bit more in the question and answer forum on our Zoom session. So join me after. Congratulations. Oops, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Try it now, Grace. Awesome, thank you. I didn't have controls to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's fantastic. Um, Try it now, Grace. Can you hear me all right? Awesome. Thank you. I didn't have controls to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's fantastic. Um, Try it now, Grace. Can you hear me all right? Awesome. Thank you. I didn't have controls to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, everyone. Try closing your YouTube video. I think we're okay now, right? 
Interesting technical glitch. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so I see from the participants that I think we have just about everybody followed us over from YouTube and thank you so much for being here. Um, Brett, if it's okay, I'll, I'll kick off with a thank you that I'd like to make. Uh, of course. Okay, great. Um, I just, I wanna thank everybody in the audience for joining tonight to see Sun Eaters uh, in this remote format. I really appreciate it. And I, I want to in particular thank everybody at Cal IT2's Qualcomm Institute for continuing the ideas performance series despite the pandemic and their support, which has made this installation and tonight possible. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share Sun Eaters with you all. Um, additionally, there's a list of people who put on ideas that I want to thank. First, Shiro Kiyadagari and Trish Stone, as well as the entire ideas production team, which includes Megan Easton, Max Carrion, Hector Bracco, Alex Matthews, Ruben Huerta, and Soshi Rojas Roja. Particularly Alex Matthews and Ruben Huerta for producing the video that we just watched. Um, and also a huge thank you to you, Professor Brett Stahlbaum, for your kind introduction. I had the great opportunity to be Brett's teaching assistant in his classes the last three years here at UC San Diego, and I learned an incredible amount. Um, and I want to acknowledge and thank Brett's Viz 11 class who are here with us tonight. Thank you all for being here, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, I'd like to turn the floor over to you guys for the thoughts that you have and, and answer them as best I can. Well, that, it's just wonderful. Grace, congratulations. Let me turn my video on. Congratulations once again. This is a really wonderful project. And I, I wanted to convey to the audience how we're going to proceed with questions and answers. And uh, what's going to happen next is that we're going to, uh, well, we're going to, we have two audiences to contend with. Some people might still be over on YouTube. Some people might be here on Zoom with us. So sort of the order of operations is going to be, we're going to ask for, because it's so much better for everybody, we're going to ask for voice, um, you know, questions to begin with. So if members of the Zoom audience can raise their hand to ask a question, that, that's going to be the best. And then we'll start to fall back to text-based questions from, from the shy uh, short, shortly after that. Um, we, I'll be monitoring the chat. Oh, there's an echo. Hmm. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, and then somebody else will be monitoring YouTube for us and passing some of the YouTube questions into the chat. So sorry about the echo. I don't know if I don't know if there's anything I can do about it or not from from my current position. Um, but I did want to start out with uh, a question for Grace. Am I am I parsable at least with the echo, Grace? Okay, good. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about audience reception and how you think of audience reception. Uh, in this piece, um, in that it deals with this diurnal cycle. So, I mean, I kind of imagine when people first see it, it's a light on a tree. But then, you know, as people maybe spend more time with it, um, it ends up being a piece for people who can really spend some quality time there. I imagine it is a piece that's going to be best understood by people who work um, in, in that corner of the campus who pass through that area frequently, because they might have a chance to go to lunch and read about what it does. And then they might have a chance to be there in the morning when the, the trees are frisky and in the evening when the trees are frisky and, and, and really have a chance to absorb in a slower and, and, and really more, um, um, you know, kind of environmental uh, way to just sort of absorb that, uh, kind of like ambient computing in a way. We could think of this as an example of ambient computing. But then you also have done you know, work, you know, in, in very, very remote forested places as well. And so I just wondered if you had any thinking, not necessarily about this piece, but thinking about that, that gradient between pieces that might be, you know, instantly understood, maybe more or more quickly digested, at least a little bit faster in a gallery versus the kind of environmental practice where there are people who inhabit the space reasonably all the way to the other extreme of maybe you have some speculation about how to, you know, make artwork for the forest where there are no people. Yeah, what a great question. Thank you, Brett. Um, you know, I think over the last few years, particularly during my master's, I've been playing with this idea of temporality, you know, the audience's attention, 
with different pieces. Um, one of the first pieces I did when I got here was like an hour long durational performance where I asked people to come and sit with something that changed very slowly over the course of that hour. Um, because when you're studying climate change, you're confronted with something that's not on the scale of a human attention span. And so how do you attempt to address that with a work of art? How do you attempt to kind of point towards things that are not at a, a human attention span with that work in, in hopes of kind of conveying something that's um, happening really slowly, but tremendously. Um, so, but back to Sun Eaters, I think with Sun Eaters, it's got different reads. And I think you kind of alluded towards that, you know, there's the immediate read that you get when you walk by and you just see the light flashing. Um, it, it, it arrests your attention. If you're walking by um, flashing lights out of the corner of your eye, it really are going to call your attention um, to them. And that that's the goal. Um, but hopefully if you do have the opportunity in your day, uh, depending on the placement of the artwork in particular here, it is possible because there's tables and chairs and people do sit out in the courtyard for lunch. If you have that time in your day to spend a little bit more um, attention with the work, then you get a whole different reading. Um, you get to kind of spend time with the tree and, um, and, and focus your thought in that way, yeah. I hope that answered your question. I think I got a bit off. There track. is a real importance for, for being there with, with these creatures and these environs, yes? Um, yeah, if you find yourself in the San Diego area and you can stop by the UC San Diego campus, I'd, I'd love for you to see these works. They're in the um, uh, Atkinson Hall courtyard, um, kind of a lot along the engineering green, not far from the visual arts department, actually. Um, but I, I, I think that we're learning through the pandemic to try and take experiences that um, we previously would always have in person and, and to translate them online. And there's value in that as well. Well, okay, good people of Earth. Um, time for the questions from the audience to come streaming in. Um, you know, let's do see some hands for uh, questions for Grace. So technically, the LED lights represent the bioelectric waves, correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. OK. Um, so how do you think um, representing the invisible bioelectric waves supposed to grab our intention about the importance of ecology? I think that it's important to notice the landscape around you. We don't often. Um, there's a uh, cognitive biases. There's a lot of cognitive biases that we have as a species. And one of them is termed plant blindness. And we have this tendency to focus because of our evolution. Um, our evolutionary survival used to depend on this. We would live in savannas or forests and we would focus on the human, the human action that was taking place in that environment. Um, as well as the animals that were moving around, we would be hunting them and um, we wouldn't pay as much attention to the vegetation around us. Um, so we had millennia of evolving to be what we would call plant blind. Um, but now things are shifting. We're at a climate crisis. We have a limited number of years to turn that around. We've got to work towards um, zero carbon emissions. And, and we really need to focus on um, the landscape and its role in that carbon capture the landscape and its role in our um, continued existence or sustainability of the ecosystems and the larger planet as a whole. Um, so one thing I, I notice on, on campus and, and around in the San Diego area, it's interesting. There are these stoplights, I mean, stop signs that people tend to run. Um, and so in the last few years, they've just started putting flashing LEDs on them saying, you know, please don't run this stop sign. Um, so I think that was an inspiration actually, as I was developing this idea is like, maybe if I can put these uh, arresting lights on the trees, then you, you won't stop and pass them by, but think of them as, as important as they are. Um, and even better that these lights are not just abstractions, but the actual translation of the bioelectricity in the plant. I think there's something that's very poetic and that I find very beautiful about that. 
Thank you for your question. Yes, thank you, Daniel, for your question. Um, Eileen has the, the floor next for a question. Eileen, please go. Yes, yeah, so uh, I actually saw this artwork because I lived right next to the Atkinson Hall and I was confused about, I was, uh, my attention was, was attracted by it, but I was like, curious like, the reason why the artwork is there and the meaning of it. So right now I understand. So I'm really uh, curious about that uh, which kind of uh, inspiration that connects you to this artwork, this work and art together. So yeah, I would like to hear your inspiration. The inspiration for this piece in particular or my larger art practice? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. And uh, for this piece particular, like uh, how do you connect the um, technology and art together into this piece? Yeah, I think, um... I think it comes out of experiments in my studio with us as all pieces do it. And, um, you know, I'm always reading things. I'm also playing with things physically in my studio while I'm also learning new technical processes. And these things tend to come together quite often in the creation of new works. And so, for example, uh, and I think I spoke a little to this in the video, um, I was looking at work from the 1970s where people were interested in this idea of does a plant have consciousness and can we measure it? Um, and so they were hooking up these plants to MIDI and translating it to sound and creating these music compositions. And there's a little bit of uh, trickery and chicanery in that because they would touch the plants and that would suddenly change the music. And they would say that was part of the plant's consciousness responding to them. But really the, the human electrical um, flux is much stronger than the plants. And so they were actually overpowering that and that's creating the, the sound shift. Um, but there was still something really poetic and beautiful about that, that I thought could be kind of resurrected for the year that we find ourselves in now. We're a bit more conscious about, yes, plants can learn. They can uh, count. For example, you've got um, the Venus flytrap, which it must be tapped at least twice before it will collapse in hopes of capturing a fly so it can count. Um, or in a number of different examples that indicate that they have a sense of knowing, but does that con constitute consciousness? Well, those things are really quite different from one another, right? Um, so I guess I, to come back to that, I was like, what could I kind of play with that would be more accurate, um, but still not lose that poetry and that beauty that they were, uh, that musicians and artists were toying with in the 70s in terms of the music. Um, and, I, and I arrived at this and I'm quite happy with that sort of translation of the electrical fluxes into to light fluxes um, in, that, uh, in that change over time that you can see through these pieces. Yeah. Yeah, electricity, light, sound, it, it's all the mathematics of waves. And, and it's a matter of translating between them. Uh, the next person who had their hand up, uh, Hee Jin, you're up. Hi, Grace, it's Hee. Congratulations, um, love the work. Hi, I can't thank wait. you. Hi, I can't wait to check it out. Um, so the question I have, um, the other day, I mean, where do I start? Um, not all plants in the human wor world are created equal, uh, meaning, not created, but treated equally. The other day I was walking towards Bath and I saw someone spraying um, uh, pesticide, not pesticide, herbicide to kill um, the little plants that come between the sidewalks or the weeds, right? So I was really curious um, if you try this electrodes on any, any other kinds of plant, thinking invasive, non-invasive, uh, native, non-native plants and I mean, I'm really curious, um, like what other plants that you work with for this? One yeah, work. absolutely. Oh, and that's so interesting because we don't value all species equally. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to point to that. We, we, we are very human centric. Um, and then because of that, we have this lens of utility, right? So what species do we consider quote unquote valuable to us? And that's a terrible way in my opinion to, uh, to view the world, right? Um, and, but to answer your question specifically of like, uh, does this work on 
other species and, and it does. And so, um, yeah, I've put these sensors on, gosh, I don't know how many species now at this point, but grasses and uh, shrubs and plants and trees and, you know, trees actually, uh, because they're so large, they actually have much higher voltage than um, smaller plants and grasses. And so when I first developed the prototype for this, um, I then moved on to doing an installation at the Lux Art Institute in Encinitas. And when I went on site, I realized that they were all maxed out. All the lights were maxed out and I was gonna have to change um, the code for the site because um, I'd mostly run it on much smaller plants and um, a, a few very spindly trees, but nothing as large as what I had done on site there. And so I suddenly realized that, um, yeah, there's quite a bit of difference in scale in terms of the, well, it's millivolts. It's not, you know, whole volts that's coming from the tree, but there's a difference in scale between the millivolts of a tree such as this one um, at the installation here at Atkins and Salt, Atkinson Hall and something like, um, you know, maybe the succulent that you might have in your backyard or something like that. Thank you, Heej, for the question. Uh, next up, we have Sharia. Um, hi. So you mentioned like when you were talking about the music from the 70s that you wanted to um, sort of let the plants like speak for themselves um, and like allow them to perform. So I was wondering if you could just sort of explain your thought process for not including any like composition on your part um, and like even like as a background sort of. Yeah, um, what a great question. Oh, I absolutely love this because it's really key to me. You know, the, the plant is creating the art. It's a collaboration in a way, right? Um, because I'm not dictating the outcome. Um, and I, I just think that there's something really wonderful when that happens where you're able to use natural processes and have the natural processes speak as a main part of the, the artwork or the installation instead of stimulating it in some abstraction or removal, instead you can just actually work with the system itself in, in describing it. And through this translation, you can do that, yeah. That was a great question. Um, next up, uh, Do Young. Uh, hello, okay, um, so my question is, um... Uh, so how and to what extent should we understand plants? Because I feel like uh, differently from animals, I personally feel that animals, we notice them more because they respond to their environments and then we could idealize them and without truly understanding what they know or like and their consciousness. So like, should we see plants in a similar way or differently? Uh, and does the absence of intelligence in a plant like, make the difference or not? Wow, that's a, that's a complex question and a wonderful question. And um, I'll speak to a few different layers of that. And one is, I guess it's not for me to decide how you should feel about plants so much um, as for me to maybe highlight that there's an opportunity for you to think more about that role that plants play in your life and, and then decide for yourself, um, you know, where you wanna go with that line of inquiry. I think that's really valuable. Um, but you're correct. Yes, we, we absolutely value, tend to pay more attention, by value I mean attention, to animals than plants. Animals are closer to us in physiology. They're more similar to us um, in temporal scale. And I think that plays into, uh, that's a major reason why that is. And then plants are so much different, right? And then further and beyond that, you could say funguses and bacterium and microbes are even more dissimilar where you have like slime molds and things that are just very difficult for us to comprehend in terms of how that might have an existence in the world, what its ontology, how it would understand the world to be. Um, I, I think it's extremely valuable to try and imagine um, the ontology that different species have in this ecosystem that we call earth and um, because we all have to find a way to um, create a, a means of being on the earth that that can last as long as possible, right? We, we want this to be an infinite 
growth system, not one that ends or terminates. Um, so we have to find a, a habitability for, for all species, which we are moving away from at this time currently. I believe Daniel had another question. Daniel? Actually, if it's all right with you, it's all right if I voice my opinion about maybe where does human um may have come from when it comes to looking at animals and plants. I would love to hear your thoughts. So what I feel like the reason um, this exists is because usually, of course, we view ourselves as something special and like, we, um, we, as, um, we are pretty much a special in a way that we have intelligence that are not solely based on survival. So um, aside from dogs or other domesticated animals that we may have trained for them to do things that can entertain us or maybe even do all, um, surprisingly, wild animals, they're intelligent, but they only use their intelligence to survive and do what they do to keep living on while we humans have intelligence to do art, do entertainment, and do other priorities of things that doesn't solely, that's not solely based on survival. And about that invasive plant um, concept, right? Um, about us um, shooting poisonous, um, poisonous gas or maybe liquid onto the invasive plants so they can, um, so they can um, pretty much die and stuff like that, right? Um, it's just that we can't really communicate with invasive plants or pretty much any plants in general. So if we see an invasive plant in our farm, we can't simply say, uh, excuse me, you're on my property. May you please get out of here? Plants are not that intelligent in communicating, nor like pretty much um, conceding to our offers. So usually we would have no choice but to view them as um, as living things that are um, that have lower intelligence or maybe lower communication, which cause us to um, have no choice but to kill them. So, what do you think of what I just said? Oh wow! All right, um, Daniel, have you heard of the term human exceptionalism? Does that mean? Um, sorry, I don't know that. No, it might be worth doing a little bit more readings on ideas of how human exceptionalism is what's led us to the climate crisis we're in right now. Um, you, you spoke a lot about terms of survival and in terms of the homo sapiens species and we're right now doing things against our own survival. We won't survive if we don't reach a, a zero carbon, right? So um, we are a peculiar species, aren't we? in the state that we find ourselves right now. It's a really interesting philosophical predicament. Um, but as a result, I think that actually only proves the point of how valuable it is to think about non-human ontologies in the earth because we humbling ourselves into putting our perspective into other species as best we can. Of course, we can't truly put ourselves in the shoes of a, of a deer or a tree or something like that. Um, but to learn from the uh, sustainability, the, the systems that are endlessly cycling instead of um, on a one-way track towards destruction would be really valuable for us as a species. Um, so there's a lot of people who are writing really interesting work about this, making interesting art about this. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to be part of that movement. And thank you very much for your thoughts. Okay, um, and thank you very much as well. I apologize if I acted like um, creatures, non-human creatures are less important. They are important. I just like, you know, just saying where the origin of human exceptionalism or like, you know, how we think humans are special came from. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want you to know, Daniel, my cats make really sophisticated emotional decisions all the time. Um, so you know, just, just for what it's worth. Uh, we had a question in the chat from Taro, um, and more of a technical question. So this is uh, this is interesting. Is it possible to detect disease or lifespan from uh, the bioelectricity of a tree? Ooh, um, yeah. So I have a lot of other questions that this work has really brought up for me, as every piece I do kind of tends to make. And I I want to do more kind of experimentation 
and see what I can kind of learn and discern from um, the electrical fluxes in, in trees, but also to start measuring different things. Um, actually, this goes back a little bit to, to what Daniel was saying. Actually, trees can communicate with one another and with other species pretty well. And, and there is a lot being written now about, you know, what can the word intelligence mean in relation to the, uh, the plant world? There's very interesting progress being made there um, because they, they emit phytonicides or these like aerosols um, and they communicate to each other through these aerosols and also to other species such as um, invading insects or insects that would like to invade and they'll send something out saying this is a dangerous place for you to invade and it's a kind of like countervalent strategy and then the insects will go somewhere else um, or they'll send out this warning signal saying I'm basically being invaded by these bulls and the other trees will start as a response generating a toxic to the bull weevils or whatever it is that's eating them, um, toxic compounds in their leaves and in their bark um, that will help protect them. Um, so yeah, we can absolutely tell the health of the tree uh, or another plant in a number of ways. I think probably best through its um, aerosols that it's making, um, but also its sound. Um, and this may be something that we'll play into future work in that they make ultrasonic sounds, sounds that are higher than the range that humans can hear. Um, and so it takes a special kind of microphone to really hear that. Um, but they make more of those sounds when they're dry, when they don't have enough water. Um, so you can very much tell whether or not a tree is parched by the sound that it's emitting. Um, and, and I'd be curious to see if we can kind of discern more data as well from the bioelectric fluxes, but uh, my hypothesis would be that that's sort of a coarse grain analysis that isn't going to give us the same amount of uh, information that the aerosols or the, or the ultrasonic sound would. Yeah, thank, um, thank you. I, I do believe that I forgot to mention that there is a different ways that plants can communicate. It's just, you know, plants can't communicate us with voices. So that's why, and we don't really have technology. I'm not quite sure if we will ever have a technology in which we can spray some specific gas telling a plant to do something. If, if we can, then that would be cool. If the plant stays alive and we, um, and pretty much our, um, our vegetation is not being um, intervened then it's cool between us and the plants but you know it's not it doesn't work that way so that's why we have no choice but to kill them okay so let's um let's move on uh i wanted to point to a couple of comments in the chat for those of you who have maybe not been able to keep up a couple of very good um suggestions for additional reading that have been presented by the audience thank you guys so much for that um also, there is a comment, uh, yes, pulling weeds can be painful and the birds screech when I prune my trees and bushes. I thought that was worth pointing out. And uh, next, I'd like to uh, recognize a question from, uh, from Director of Ideas, Shiroki Adegari. Dear colleague, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Brad. Thank you for this great presentation. Thank you, Grace. It's really, uh, I found it an excellent piece. I think you're you're very successful in making us aware of whatever is happening. I mean, we call it consciousness or whatever we want to call it, that there is life happening there. And this uh, bringing it into another sensory feel does make us give it more attention. And I think often giving attention is a form of communication. And it will, something happens there. I know as they, they were talking about uh, issues of the uh, health of trees. There are documented forms that acupuncture on trees work and is exactly is re uh, aligning the electrical currents that happens in a tree that helps them even fight uh, bugs better. Uh, I'm curious and, and thanks for calling the, the, the trees performers that they are your performers, they are, uh, you know, kind of the center of the attention here. And, and now that you said you have worked with many trees, did you find, did you sense anything that could be defined as character with these trees that you've been working, now that you've been working with them for quite a while? 
you've, you've seen them and now you've spent many hours with these specific trees in front of Atkinson Hall. Can you share anything that may say you, you have some form of communication? And of course, I'm not talking about a metaphysical communication that you feel like they showed a specific character to you that you know, and in, uh, I'm remembering in Secret Life of Plants that uh, they they talked about that you could actually they could sense presence, and I wonder uh, anything that has solidified you know for you in this period as you've been working on this piece. Well, there's thank you very much, and that's very kind of you to say. Um, there's something very concrete that I can point to with the tree that's in this image behind me. That's also in. Um, the center of concrete of the courtyard. There's a planter in the middle of a, a vast area of concrete. And then beyond that, there's um, grasses and most of the other trees that, um, all the other trees that these are planted in are among the grasses. Um, but this one has two lights on it in the middle of this sort of oasis of the concrete. And it is just lit up. The two sun eaters that are on that are at their max brightness all the time and I've been out a few nights now observing since I did the installation last week um, whereas the others are, are often fluxing at um, lower millivolt range and so you see them um, fluxing a lot faster so they appear just sort of steadfast but that's because they're just kind of shooting off the register of what these um, orbs are, are measuring at this moment or, or the the sensors are measuring and then what I'm outputting to the orbs. Um, so I wonder, I'm curious if this tree has had to become, I don't know, has had to compensate in some way or become stronger or push out its roots further or as, has established a deeper uh, taproot or something that's created that higher electrical voltage, I'm not sure. Maybe as a compensation for being amidst this um, kind of, in this island of concrete, I don't know. Thank you. Grace, I wanted to acknowledge uh, that Yeti here endorses your work. He's been uh, <laughs> he's been Zoom bombing hi, my Eddie. classes all quarter. He just wanted to come up and say hi because you were a TA for me for so many times. So it's the only Zoom bombing incident I've, I've suffered in my remote teaching has been from this cat. Um, <laughs> I'd like to recognize Alexandra Newman, who's a, a wonderful TA in the current Viz 10 class. Alexandra has a question. Uh, hi, Grace. Maybe it's a little bit similar to the last one, but in a more general sense, I was curious, like over time in your process of making these kinds of works so of sensing and visualizing plant signals, like how has your experience changed phenomenologically, like the way that you walk around with the in the world like with this extra kind of perception oh my gosh thank you what a great question alex um uh yeah i i find myself just constantly paying attention to all the trees and plants around me everywhere i go and it's kind of like the highlight of any walk that i i take between a class or um between different appointments or things like that is being able to see the trees around me. So, um, you know, I guess maybe occupational hazard or or maybe this was a tendency in me. I'm sure it was actually before I started this and this has just sort of brought it to the fore in an even bigger way. But yeah, that is the best part of my day is often just noticing the, the trees and vegetation around me. Thanks. Okay, we uh, let's, uh, Director of Qualcomm Institute is here. Hello, Ramesh. Uh, I'd okay. like to uh, give you a chance to ask a question. Thanks. Hi. Thanks, Brett. Uh, Grace, I enjoyed uh, your work, uh, watching it. Uh, it's very evocative. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer by training, so I'm going to ask you a somewhat technical question, uh, which you probably encountered as you were setting up your installation. You know, we like to separate signals from noise. And if you were wanting to actually measure your own heart rate waveform, one of the things you would learn to do is how to uh, you know, extract the actual signal from the many disturbances uh, that you also pick up. So when you are doing this work, did you have to look at that? You know, it, so how do you know that the signal that you're measuring is actually the electrical signal from the tree and not ambient noise because of all sorts of other reasons? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing is that if uh, this were, the electrodes were attached to the leaf instead of the trunk, 
then it would be really fluctuant dependent on like the wind that's coming by and um, it's a much lower millivolt that's um, fluxing through the leaf. So like if um, a bird landed on the branch near where the leaf was, that could actually be measured as well. Um, but some, that actually is interesting to me because you're kind of measuring the, the environs. Um, but it has to be grounded. Um, so say where if you were measuring your own heartbeat, you would really want, um, you, you would want to make sure that you were grounding it. And the same is true with the tree. And so um, if the tree were not actually growing into the earth, it would not be grounded. I wouldn't be able to ground that signal. Um, and, but I, I can just because of that. So like, I can't really just place these electrodes on say like a bird while it was flying, there would be no signal at all. Or if somehow you were able to measure a, a person while they were not standing on the ground, for example, that would again, not be grounded. Um, but uh, again, I kind of consider this to be um, poetic of the environment. And so I'm not, I'm not dis dissatisfied by the sort of uh, fluctuations that are coming through if someone were to place their hand on a tree, for example, and it would measure that as well. Um, I think that would be fine. Yeah. yeah. You know, the reason I ask this question is not entirely technical, although it is an important technical thing you would study if you're an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. But there is evidence that trees actually communicate, as you were alluding to, with other trees to warn them of danger. So it's not just the sensing of uh, their, uh, you know, nutritional, like, you know, photosynthesis and this sort of stuff, but they're actively trying to communicate with others in their environment. So to be able to pull out that signal uh, would be yeah. quite interesting because you would actually learn to, you know, what they're trying to say to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, they're pushing nutrients through their roots with the connection of another species with fungus. So the root tip will connect to a mycorrhizal network, which then connects to another root tip of, of another tree. And these all mesh. So all these trees that have these lights on them, they're actually are signaling to each other. Um, and in a forest, you would do the same. And something that's very interesting that's been found recently, and we have no idea what, how, how this takes place, but they can uh, direct that flow of nutrients that they share through these mycorrhizal networks on purpose, not just to like all the trees, but they can pinpoint specific ones. So if there's like a young vulnerable tree and then an older tree that's, um, you know, uh, losing its life, it can choose, they don't know how, but they, it, it can choose to send all its nutrients to the youngest, most um, at risk tree in the forest and therefore, they do have this um, mutualism, this um, ecology of, um, of, of, of mutual benefit that's just, and support, which is just really incredible and kind of contrary to how humans imagine their ecologies and economies. Yeah. Thank you, Ramesh. Yeah. More work is needed here for sure. We have a question from Heej Kim. Um, Chris, I, actually, it's not really a question, but I just wanted to show my appreciation for um, just for the energy that you're giving out with this work, because I feel like when we are talking about climate change, it, it could easily go to this dystopian narrative. connection that we have with our environment with uh, non humans. And um, I really get the sense and I, I think that's a beautiful gesture and I'm here for it. So I, I just really wanted to say that, that oh, out loud you. and thank you. Thank you, EJ. I really appreciate that. Yeah. You know, we're at a, a the most challenging time for our species, but in that way, it's actually the greatest opportunity for our species. And that's the way I think we should think about it. Thank you so much for that question. And that is a beautiful place to wrap this up. A really, a really poetic moment uh, on which to conclude um, our presentation tonight. So I, Grace, thank you so much for sharing your work uh, with the community. Uh, we really appreciate it so much. It's really fantastic work. And there, you know, I don't know if you were able to keep track of the either of the chats, but there was a, there was just a great 
you know, large number of congratulations, uh, you know, scrolling up the screen there. So really, really well deserved and, and the audience totally, totally agrees. I wanna thank again, everybody at Qualcomm Institute, uh, all of you amazing people, um, you know, uh, throughout, throughout your org chart, um, you know, Qualcomm Institute is an important place. And um, I, I really wanna thank you all for, for hosting us tonight and, and making this really interesting conversation possible. And finally, I wanna thank everybody who came tonight and everybody who asked questions, just a remarkable set of questions, just, you know, really, really, I think really, really we unpacked this a lot and, and uh, I just can't thank you all enough. I wanna remind everybody about next week's event, a week from today at five o'clock, um, you can look on the, the QI Ideas website for that uh, Robert Castro piece. And uh, with that, we will, we will close the session. Thank you everybody, thanks for coming. Thank you all so much.